One of the greatest challenges to health span associated with aging is grappling with the enormous toll of Alzheimer's disease. This global challenge requires global collaborations and global solutions. In this spotlight session, our panel of leading experts brings together diverse worldly perspectives on actionable approaches to tackle this devastating disease. Please welcome Niranjan Bose, Managing Director, Health and Life Sciences, Gates Ventures. Ivan Chung, Chairman, Isai Inc., Global President of Neurology Business Group, Isai Co. Limited. George Vredenberg, Convener, the Global CEO Initiative on Alzheimer's Disease. Founding Chairman, Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. Chairman and Co-Founder, Us Against Alzheimer's. And Session Leader, Stacy Weninger, President of F Prime Biomedical Research Initiative. All right, well, I will just start by welcoming everyone, and I really appreciate everyone's taking the time to join us for this conversation about, you know, really trying to get concrete about what are the barriers and how can we help to overcome those in fighting um, the global challenge of Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, I just want to start by saying we, we all understand and everyone watching this understands that this is a huge problem. Um, I don't think we need to dwell on how big of a challenge Alzheimer's disease is, how much of a societal problem it is. I also would like to just start with the premise that everyone agrees that to be able to really have game changing therapeutics here, we need to treat earlier. We need to treat very early. We need to be able to understand how to identify those individuals that are going to go on to develop symptomatic Alzheimer's disease in that early pre-symptomatic space. We need to be able to figure out how do we develop therapeutics? That we, if we have to test before symptoms, how do we do that? How do we identify people? And how do we change the landscape of clinical care with the idea that you know, we need to start identifying people very, very early and getting them on therapeutics eventually? So there, there's so many challenges here that I really thought it was important to start with. We all agree to these basic issues. Now we need to figure out what can we do concretely as a global community of various stakeholders, um, researchers, clinicians, funders, government bodies, um, et cetera, to really start to move the needle on treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So I am thrilled to have an esteemed panel here um, that we can begin to really look at this issue from different angles to start with. And so I'm actually going to start just by asking each of the panelists to give a few, a few sentences, a few comments on what do, you, what do you see as ways that we can start to change the global landscape of Alzheimer's disease research and care such that we can really start developing, delivering the kinds of therapeutics that we all are striving for. Um, so from each of your perspectives, kind of what are, the, what are the biggest issues and let's start talking concretely about how we can overcome them. So George Radenberg, I'm going to start with you and ask you to just make a few comments from your point of view. Uh, thank you, Stacy, and uh, thanks uh, to the organizers of uh, this forum. Uh, the notion of healthy aging makes no sense if one doesn't deal with the brain. Uh, so you're absolutely right to focus on the global aspects of, of, of this problem. So I chair something called the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. This is a partnership between the Global CEO Initiative on Alzheimer's uh, and the World Economic Forum. And the World Economic Forum called us uh, saying that they believed Alzheimer's was now a global health issue of uh, scale and impact comparable to, uh, to uh, pandemics uh, and infectious diseases. Uh, they had uh, they had incubated uh, Gavi and Sepi, uh, and as a consequence, they thought it useful to develop a global mechanism to look at the global scale of the problem and try and define some uh, global approaches to solutions. Uh, so we spent about a year with a wide variety of stakeholders, over 150, trying to find what it is that might be added at a global scale that wasn't happening in a national scale or in any particular sector. 
Uh, so these are the three things we came up with as approaches to approaching this issue differently, not with a view of substituting a global mechanism for any national uh, or sectoral mechanism, uh, but also uh, uh, basically to link and scale existing efforts in new ways. And if we found an area uh, that was not being dealt with to develop some program within that area. Uh, so we first started with uh, the fact that uh, global uh, uh, discovery research is basically being done uh, in Japan, United States and Europe. Uh, um, uh, and that therefore we ought to be able to, to try and find a way to link the cohorts that do, do exist around the world that have been created for some other reason, whether it's malaria, whether it's uh, HIV AIDS or just epidemiological cohorts uh, and invest in them in a way that will enable them to gather the evidence relevant to uh, early Alzheimer's. So you're exactly right. Uh, what is it that we need to collect in the way of data in these cohorts uh, and then uh, uh, enable them to participate in contributing uh, data to, uh, to, to, to this problem. Uh, so uh, then we have to obviously link those cohorts through new data sharing mechanisms and uh, Bose is on this panel and has been deeply involved in, in that effort to identify uh, to identify mechanisms uh, to share the data that we collect from all of these cohorts around the world. Uh, so we've also developed a, a polygenic risk score that we can identify people at risk, uh, get them into these cohorts in ways that in fact will track them through time. And as you said, be able to identify uh, what it is and when it is that we ought uh, to be uh, intervening uh, through, uh, through health systems. The second area was global clinical trials. Uh, most clinical trials, as everyone knows, are done company by company or government by government, but they're not uh, through a common platform. A platform uh, for support of clinical trials will enable uh, innovation in the clinical trial space more generally, rather than having each company do the innovation, which they have no incentive to do because they don't have uh, you know, half a dozen Alzheimer's drugs uh, in uh, clinical trials at any point in time. So we need a platform that in fact is invested in innovations in clinical trial start and speed and quality. Uh, so that's the second area that we identified. And the third area was health systems. It makes no sense for us to develop therapeutic products if we don't have uh, around the world health systems that can identify, as you said, Stacey, identify people at the right stage of the disease and introduce to those populations uh, uh, the drug that's most appropriate for them at their stage of disease uh, and the nature of the Alzheimer's variations or variants that they might have. Those basically solve two problems that exist in the world. Right now, discovery research is in isolated cohorts, relatively small, relatively homogeneous. If we work at a global scale, we'll get scale and we'll get diversity so that we can go after populations that right now are not in the discovery space. 90% of the genetics work has been done in white Caucasians. Uh, most of the people of the world are not white Caucasians. Uh, two thirds of the people in the world that have Alzheimer's are not in the United States or, or Europe. Uh, they are in uh, other countries of the world, particularly the middle income countries uh, in Asia. The second thing that this particular approach adopts is, is the notion that in fact the schema of how we're going to address Alzheimer's and get therapeutics to market more rapidly is a systems approach that starts with research, but goes through clinical trials, that goes to regulatory systems, that goes to payer systems, uh, and then are marketed inside uh, health systems around the world or directly to consumers potentially. So we deal with the problem of systems issues to make sure that we're thinking through all of the links from research to patient uh, in this particular initiative, because not many people are paying a lot of attention to health systems in terms of how to get them at a primary care level, able, as you say, to detect this disease early, to diagnose it early, and to be able to uh, introduce therapeutic products as they come to market in the right population at the right time. So that's what the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative is doing. Uh, it is basically a totally an action-oriented uh, organization. Uh, I am a, 
a patient advocate. I'm a lawyer by background and practice, but I've had three generations of my family uh, who had Alzheimer's and I don't want my kids and my grandkids to have it. So if we don't operate more rapidly than we have in the last 40 years, uh, when my grandmother got this disease, uh, my kids and my grandkids are at risk. So I'm driven by a patient's orientation, which says faster, better, work together. So that's my story. Well, we'll stick to it. Thank you, George. I think you've raised so many really interesting points that I would love to dive into. Um, I'm going to give everyone else a chance, and I, I suspect that Ivan and Rose will also carry on a, a few of these different topics, but um, this was a great introduction, and I think there's a lot that we can dig into there. Um, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to ask Ivan to maybe build on what George said and, and give your own perspective on a few of the things that we should be talking about. Thank you, Stacy, and uh, uh, a huge thank you to the organizers for uh, this uh, very timely uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, my name is Ivan Chiang, and uh, I am the uh, U.S. Chairman and the Global President for Neuroscience at um, ASA. And uh, I want to pick up on something George uh, mentioned, the third item about uh, uh, healthcare system preparedness. And actually, the um, Davos um, Alzheimer's Collaborative is a wonderful example of how all stakeholders around the world come together for such an uh, important uh, uh, initiative around the health system um, uh, preparedness. Um, actually, um, um, if I trace back uh, uh, in the history of Alzheimer's disease, uh, ASI has been at this for about almost 40 years. Uh, to fight this devastating disease. And about um, over 20 years ago, uh, ASI was uh, very much involved in uh, introducing the uh, first wave of uh, Alzheimer's disease treatments. Uh, at that time, of course, uh, symptomatic treatments, cholinesterase inhibitors. And we remember vividly over 20 years ago how healthcare system preparedness was a critical topic because at that time, uh, majority of the world uh, may not understand that Alzheimer's disease is actual, that Alzheimer's disease was actually a disease. Uh, that's uh, the fight back then. Now we are, um, you know, very much involved uh, in that next wave of therapeutics, this time targeting the underlying pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And again, healthcare system preparedness, a new wave of healthcare system preparedness is critically important as we move from the framework 20 years ago, focused on clinical symptoms to a new framework now, focusing on biomarkers and the underlying pathophysiology of the brain, given the amazing works of scientists and clinicians around the world to start to really unravel what this disease is. So when, when we think about healthcare system preparedness uh, in ASI, and, and by the way, uh, we are an active participant in the um, Davos uh, Alzheimer's Collaborative, I should have said earlier. Um, there are really three things uh, we are really focusing on. Um, and number one is uh, irrespective of GDPs, irrespective of where you go in the world, um, the lack of attention to the importance of ne uh, neurological health, brain health, and regular screening of mental issue. Uh, that's, that's the number one thing. Uh, a report in 2017 showed that in the community and the residential setting, over 60% undetected dementia, as recently as, again, a report in 2017. A second issue in the health system preparedness that we're focusing on is the lack of physicians trained to do early detection of Alzheimer's disease in this new framework of biomarker-driven, uh, underlying pathophysiology-driven world of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease understanding. So the kind of early detection that uh, many communities learned to do 20 years ago based on clinical symptoms, now we gotta train everyone again to do it differently as science has obviously evolved. Uh, the third item in terms of uh, health system uh, preparedness is really about the a healthcare infrastructure. Again, prepare the healthcare infrastructure in this new world of uh, biomarkers and therapeutics targeting the under 
underlying pathophysiology of the brain in terms of the diagnostic and therapeutic workup, especially in uh, low-income countries. So uh, these are the really three points I want to further build on what uh, George mentioned earlier about uh, health system preparedness. Thank you, Stacey. No, thank you. I mean, I think these are are es essential points. And and there's a there's a question that I, I hope we come back to a little bit, which is also it's it's what should we be doing today in the healthcare setting? What should we be doing today to prepare for the future state? And what should the future state look like? Because I think there's a big difference in what we're doing today with limited ability to treat versus what we might do once we really accomplish having a suite of therapeutics out there. Bose, I'll turn it to you and give a little bit of a chance to give your perspective on things. Well, thank you, Stacey, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to join this eminent panel. And George and Ivan are hard act to follow, but I, I will try. Um, as Gates Ventures, our partnerships in Alzheimer's disease uh, started about five or so years ago. And uh, I want to acknowledge the contributions that this ecosystem of partners gave to us in the sense of learning, helping us understand the challenges, the bottlenecks. And I think, Stacey, you captured them very well in the opening. We need to identify folks earlier to be able to treat them earlier and change the landscape of uh, clinical care for patients and, and their caregivers. Our investments to date have focused on early detection. That's a partnership that we have with an ecosystem of partners, including the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation to stand up the diagnostics accelerator. Um, the second area where we've had significant investments is in uh, the need to diversify the therapeutic pipeline. And we started that with our investment with the Dementia Discovery Fund, where uh, again, uh, there are a host of uh, pharma partners uh, in that fund alongside with us. The one theme that I want to uh, pick up where George and Ivan left is on uh, a cross-cutting theme or cross-cutting pillar on data. Um, and, and to this effect, thanks to, again, um, a dozen or so partners who came together along with us to understand what could a group of committed organizations, philanthropies, pharmaceutical companies, nonprofits, uh, federal funding agencies do to enable broader data access, broader data sharing, and build a more vibrant, robust user community. And that set of pilot discussions is what has resulted in, um, in that group of partners, including ourselves, committing to uh, funding the Alzheimer's Disease Data Initiative, or ADDI. And uh, I would view ADDI as a consortium of partners, uh, an initiative, and also as a standalone nonprofit entity with the core mission of trying to unlock more data sets for users, for researchers, to make data computational platforms more available, accessible to the users, and most importantly, lowering the barriers to data access. Uh, rather than saying it would be a centralized database or an aggregated database, I would I would view it as a, a federated model of sharing where the data owners, the data contributors still have the ability to permission data access, but the user experience gets a lot better. The barriers get lowered with the single view or objective that maybe potential novel insights could come out of that data analyses uh, that could lead to early diagnosis potential mechanisms of action that could be uh, tested uh, in the clinic? And, and lastly, could there be ways for us to make enrollment in clinical trials a lot easier for the families and generations to come? And what are some of the creative solutions that as a global research community, and with so much interest in recognizing this as a global problem, how can we get different countries to come together in terms of allowing data sharing in a way that protects the privacy and protects the individuals and studies, but also enables the research? Yeah, great question. And, and I'm going to uh, perhaps collapse a few of those into three categories and, and say, 
Uh, the first is understanding the consent, understanding uh, how, what type of consent uh, under which this data was collected and what are those privacy concerns that the data owners or data contributors are trying to safeguard. I think um, it isn't one size fit all. So we do need perhaps the concept of a help desk that can engage with the data contributors who want to share the data. Almost all of them want to share the data. Uh, it perhaps to some it's varying degrees or varying levels of data access. So I think we need to have a conversation with each one of them and it's time consuming, but if it's needed, I think that's what we're gonna to have to commit, the concept of a, a concierge or help desk to try and navigate those constraints and to at least have a minimal set of data shared that is within the realms of the privacy and the consent. I think the second is there are federated virtual appliance type models that tech companies have actually spearheaded quite a lot that we should be able to embrace. And again, not just embrace, but be willing to, to educate the data owners, the data platform, the data contributors to bring them along. Um, it's, it's easier said than done that this technological challenge or solution exists, but I think it's more important to also make people aware of that, to do some pilots and show that it's truly doable and one we can overcome. I think the third aspect, and this is one that we have heard uh, very recently, is retrospective studies. Often the data set exists, folks want to share it, but then there are instances where they don't want to take on the burden. The, 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 the sponsor or the data owner does not want to take the burden of being the permissioning authority, uh, given that time and resources it takes. So in those instances, identifying a mechanism, whether an exa a good example is the Welcome Trust uh, uh, Data Access Committee that exists to enable such permissioning in the future. So identifying more creative ways of overcoming these challenges and barriers would be extremely helpful. No, I, that's very helpful. And I, I love the idea of the concierge or the help desk approach. Um, along those lines, George, I'm going to look to you just as you were talking about these various global cohorts. Um, do, you, do you see the kinds of solutions that Bose is talking about being helpful in those situations working? Uh, part of the problem is uh, making sure that the cohort operator uh, knows uh, how to collect the data and to do it with integrity and with a standardized form. Though we're working right now, particularly in low and re resource settings, uh, you don't have imaging equipment. You don't have big PET scans. Uh, so how do you how do you work with data in that context? And the answer is digital, uh, in smartphones with huge penetration around the world. So we are now innovating a digital collection of cognitive assessment data. We started in Malaysia. Uh, where intriguingly, uh, uh, parts of the population do not have a written language. You could not do a MIMSI there, uh, paper and pencil if you tried. But cell phone penetration is 200%. So you start with innovative people in Malaysia who are now beginning to digital phenotype large segments of their population uh, through digital techniques, whether it's a voice print, uh, whether it's other um, uh, efforts, to, but basically through voice, because uh, you don't have uh, wearables there. You have to work through and a very limited data collection advice, a device. Uh, but if you can get everyone to collect voice prints systematically through time, you can detect cognitive impairment fairly early in the course of a disease. So that's what we're working on with Bose and his innovative efforts at Gates Ventures. So Ivan, I'm going to actually turn to you and talk about, okay, so, um, you know, let's imagine that future state. What should we be preparing for based on these kinds of new innovative findings that we're going to have? And what do we want the future to look like in terms of clinical care in the healthcare system? Thank you, Stacey. Uh, first of all, I would say that a lot of these uh, technological innovations, they are already being incorporated in clinical trials of therapeutics. Um, the ASI and other companies, uh, when we're doing our large phase three trials 
for the so-called um, disease modifying therapies, these tools and technologies are being incorporated so that at first in a controlled environment, we know how these tools perform. And so far, I would say um, the progress is actually much faster than people had expected. And um, in terms of a future state, I think you can, you know, imagine in, I guess, in that five-year range, maybe I'm being uh, optimistic, but you have to be optimistic so that we can all work harder <laughs> together, is, um, you know, you have this kind of a seamless world from at home to the physician, physician's office, how, for example, digital, uh, digital cognitive screening becomes a uh, pervasive and how from a confirmatory standpoint, a blood draw, a simple blood test can tell you a number of uh, biomarkers implicated in the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease because we do believe every Alzheimer's disease patient will have a different biomarker footprint so that therapeutics can be tailored uh, in the future, five, 10 years down the road. And then also from a monitoring perspective, once a patient is on a therapeutic option or multiple options, given their biomarker footprint, how we monitor the treatment effect, how we can help them uh, monitor any safety signals, uh, you know, and manage the safety signals uh, uh, in advance. Uh, that's kind of how um, we see the future. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, physicians being trained to do that, uh, hospital systems being equipped to do that, and the payers willing to invest in the infrastructure to do that. We need national plans in every country, which of course requires global coordination and best practice sharing. Um, and, and that's why a number of these initiatives that George and Bose mentioned are so critically important. Thank you, Stacey. So let me, Stacey, can I try and answer your question? What do yeah, we do today? Because we're trying to do something today. We have, uh, in our health system preparedness work, we have six flagship countries in which we have a health system that uh, uh, says, I want to adopt a protocol uh, consistent across all these countries, uh, probably local variations in terms of skill and environment. But nevertheless, there are, we have projects now in Brazil, Mexico, Jamaica, the UK, United States, and Japan. We just put out an RFP to say, who's the next round? Uh, uh, of health systems that want to step up and take some steps to adopt a protocol for primary care to detect and diagnose this disease. We had 75 responses from 21 different countries. There is an appetite out there uh, in health systems to try and figure this out because they see it coming. <laughs> they see this wave, this gathering storm. So there's an appetite for change. It's up to us, I think, to enable the mechanisms by which they can understand that and then adopt protocols. So we have a actually a, a, a intervention science company that we say, okay, we want to monitor systematically how each of these health systems is either adopted the standard protocol or adapted it for their environment and what's caused the adaptation and how, uh, how are they actually implementing this in patients. We then have this sort of learning lab to Ivan's point, uh, a learning lab of all of these healthcare systems and the ministries of health in these countries. Uh, and presumably as we get another 10, 20 uh, countries adopting this uh, to have a learning system where people work from the ground up. And yes, we do need national plans so that the, the governments in these countries are committed to the change. But we also need to work from the bottom up to actually affect that change and demonstrate, uh, demonstrate that it can be demonstrate that it can be implemented in their countries. And in this plan, I mean, again, let's get concrete. Would the, is the proposal of these protocols, is this a everyone's annual visit starting at what, age 40? Starts to get these, you know, these standard cognitive and biomarker tests. I mean, if we're, if we're, when we, when we shift from 
PET scans and MRIs to blood tests and, you know, a digital at home cognitive test, things suddenly become much more feasible in terms of volume and scale and how you can do things. So when we when we're shifting to a quick digital cognitive test and a blood test, is that how early do you start and do you do this every year and do you start flagging people um, really early as a healthcare system and both to identify for potential therapeutics to identify just for life planning and to you know identify to help enrollment in these trials that we that we all want that you know you're going to have a better chance the earlier you get in what's what's that concrete plan look like in that vision of today and five years from now and 10 years from now? And then five years out, we'll hopefully have multiple blood tests on market that are much more widely distributed uh, and which can be delivered the next day, just traditionally the way we get blood tests today. So you're, you're absolutely right. What is today? We're walking. Uh, what is tomorrow? We're jogging. And then what is it in five to 10 years? We're in the marathon. We're all running fast. Uh, and I do think, though, you got to start. You got to start. And so we want to do for brain health what we've been doing for years with oncology. It's a uh, cancer center uh, that basically is everything from early detection, referral to clinical trials, all the bells and whistles that you and your wildest dreams, Stacey, might imagine. They're doing it for competitive reasons. Not sure that that's the same everywhere else. But right now, I think this is beginning to penetrate the psyche of health system um, managers who want to be at the forefront of the next round of healthcare. I think we also have to penetrate the the community that you know. I, there, you brought up oncology trials. There's a very big difference because I think when someone receives a cancer diagnosis, the first thoughts are. You know, is there a current therapeutic or is there a good clinical trial I can get into? Because there's historically been seen some miraculous treatments for certain cancers that have come out of clinical trials and people see hope there. I have it there and I'm curious from your perspective and, and coming from a company trying to develop these therapeutics and enrolling people yes. in trials, okay. what you see. As I mentioned earlier, I do believe that we're on the verge of that next wave of um, disease modifying therapies initially for the early symptomatic stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease. But as we all know, uh, the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease started many, many years uh, before the onset of even light uh, symptoms. So um, ASI and other companies are now not only doing clinical trials for the early symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease, but Many of us are involved in doing clinical trials and at ASI, we have a collaboration with the ACTC consortium in doing um, a phase three clinical trial in so-called preclinical Alzheimer's disease or uh, pre-symptomatic pre Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, equally important because we cannot keep saying, you know, Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, started many years before onset of symptoms without, uh, you know, industry like ourselves actually investing into showing people that this is indeed true and how therapeutics may uh, slow down or prevent uh, such onset. So I just want to add that uh, uh, background for everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, with that, I'm going to say, well, I think we are very much um running over time here, but I do want to kind of give everyone a, a last word or a last thought on something critical. And Bose, I'm going to start with you because I think Ivan and George have, you know, we've been talking more recently. So I'll turn it over to you for a moment. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. Uh, the diagnostic space uh, doesn't seem attractive to traditional venture investments or even mm, uh, equity investments, largely because the question often is, what's going to be the market? For these diagnostics. I think that goes back again to George's point. We need health systems to be prepared. We need them to commit to help uh, countries to commit to health plans. So then it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. You have to break this somewhere. And uh, um, that, that's what prompted us to um, raise funds for the diagnostics accelerator. Um, we're willing to put those at, at risk dollars to be able to accelerate these companies, these small biotechs, and diagnostics companies to be able to bring their tests to market and commercialize them. 
with the optimism that soon we will have those treatments, whether those treatments come uh, in the next couple of years, whether they come by 2030, they're bound to come. Uh, I'm optimistic. I think we're all optimistic that industry is very capable of solving that challenge. And while doing so, can we give them the arsenal for early detection? And once we have early detection, then you can go into your prevention trials and diversify your mechanisms of action. So I remain optimistic. It is challenging, but I think um, it, it is a solvable problem if we commit to some collaborative action. Ivan, any closing thoughts from you? Health disparities. Um, I think we learned that in the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, unfortunately, uh, more visible than, than ever in Alzheimer's. Uh, this is uh, something we uh, cannot forget. And many of these technologies we just talked about will help solve that uh, health disparity. So that's my final comment. Thank you. Wonderful. Very true. George, any final, final closing thoughts? Well, I'm going to throw something out there that probably will be modestly uh, speculative, but I hope by the end of this decade, we have a vaccine. We have vaccines in preclinical development and now in early clinical development. And I think if we think through all the problems that those products may have in getting through this system, how do you conduct a clinical trial on a vaccine that's administered 15 to 20 years before symptoms? Uh, how do you uh, detect those people? How do you get a clinical trial that lasts long enough or relies on sufficient surrogate biomarkers that you can actually say these are the people on the way and the regulators accept that? How are payers going to react and whether or not this is reasonable and necessary? Are there, we're going to need advanced manufacturing commitments like we did with COVID. Uh, and how are we going to get health systems, to your original point, Stacey, how are we going to get health systems to be able to detect 50 people 15 to 20 years before symptoms based upon the earliest micro move on, a, on an amyloid or a tau or some other mechanism uh, so that we can get a vaccine into the system? I, I just think we have to set some big goals here that will drive us all to thinking through all the steps we need to take now to be in a position, whether it's in five years or 10 years, to really have accelerants uh, through the entire system of research, development, clinical trials, regulators, payers, health systems, consumers, uh, so that in fact, we can get those to consumers faster. Right now, we're focused so much on research, which is so far away from an actual solution for a customer, a patient, anybody, uh, that uh, that it, it is it is for a, a patient advocate a frustrating situation where we're not thinking about where we have to be in five or ten years. To your point, uh, in order to set the systems in place that makes this like much faster process of getting product from research uh, into into patients. No, I think I think you're absolutely right. I want to thank each of you. I, I think this is it's such an important global issue as we started so many different stakeholders involved, but I'm getting um, much more optimistic that as we're working together, it does take everything from the research to the planning and, and the global sharing and et cetera. But I am extremely optimistic that the face of Alzheimer's disease and how we treat it and how we think about it is going to look very, very different in decades to come. So I wanna thank everyone for your time and um, we'll close there and look forward to future conversations. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Stacey.